Okay, today is uh, 4 September 2007. We are at the Henry Johnson Charter School in Albany, New York. And uh, the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Eric Stott. And we are doing an interview with uh, Norman Herbert. Uh, sir, would, for the record, would you please state your full name um, and your date of birth, please? Uh, Norman E. Herbert, Jr., uh, born March the 7th, 1947. Okay, and whereabouts were you born? Uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, did you uh, attend school there? Yeah, I went to uh, Benjamin Franklin High School, and I was in the uh, 12th grade six months before my graduation. I dropped out. Okay. And um, I left in 19... I left um, September the 19th, 1966. Uh, it was kind of funny uh, about my draft. Um, I had joined Job Corps uh, because of an incident that happened. I watched my best friend get killed, and I just got tired. So I dropped out of school. I left and went to Job Corps. From Job Corps, I graduated from Job Corps and went to Vista, and I was a recreation instructor. And at the same time, I was on my way, to, I had a scholarship to go to Florida A&M. But at the same time, my mother had got my draft notice, and she opened it. <laughs> and when she opened it, that automatically put me in the responsibility to answer the call. But if she had left it closed, then it took time. I was, I've been in college at the time, mm -hmm. and I, would, I would got the, the deferment. So she opened it, she called me and told me that I had a draft notice, she sent it to me. So it was funny, I was, as she was sending the draft notice, I was sitting down watching TV, and um, at that time they used to use bingo as a means of drafting. And they tell you, well, a flash came on, tell you get your draft card, blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that, and you sit there. And uh, the balls be bouncing around, and as the balls bounce around, each number will pop up. They will put it in like uh, B, and then they will go down the line. In between that, that my number popped up. <laughs> and when it popped up, I just shook my head. I said, oh, no. Nah. And here come the draft notice. So I had to come home. When I came home, it was, it was summer in Philadelphia, but it was cold in Colorado. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the funny thing about it, when I got home, I think I had two days, and I had to go to the draft board. Right when I got to the draft board, they examine you, and mm -hmm. they um, take you in a room, you take a test. And the funny thing about it, if you fail the, the eighth grade test, they give you another test, which is a fourth grade test. And then if you fail that, then they go down and give you a second grade test. If you fail that, then they take you right out. The guys be waiting outside and take you straight to jail. And you don't, you don't go past go. You go straight to jail. Because they know now that you are actually trying to avoid the draft. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pass in the test. And next thing I know, I was in uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, that's why I took my base of that. That was my entry point. And then from there... And now... Uh it, it was your, um, was it an infantry basic or just a standard basic training? Uh, standard basic training. Yeah. Um, from there I just took basic training and then they were going to ship us out. So it took us um, eight weeks, really ten weeks, mm -hmm. just before um, Thanksgiving I would finish basic training. From there we would go to our advanced training, whatever we was going to school or okay. the infantry. So I wound up going to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri as a supply clerk for OJT. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got there, you know, just like any soldier, off limits, when you say off limits, it's really what is off limits and I got busted twice on an off limit place where, you know, where they were scamming selling alcohol and uh, prostitution. Mm -hmm. So me and a friend of mine, uh, we wound up going to Germany together. And uh, we both got busted. <laughs> and the funny thing about it, the same night they took us back to the post, we turned around and went back. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and uh, me and him laugh about it. And then the next thing I know, the about six months, seven months later, I was in Germany, uh, and I was there in '67 and '68. I went there as a supply clerk, wanted to be a generator operator because I was in a missile company. I was in Hawks, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the same year that Russia invaded um, one of the countries over there, and we went on alert, full alert, and happened one of the German planes had flew over our area about five, about five miles inside our, our kill zone, so we had to shoot it down. So they covered it up and say, well, nothing happened, both the Russians and Americans. But it was fun, though. I was like, I was five. I was ten miles from the border, the German border. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, now, uh, now you were drafted for two years, right? Yeah. And at some point, did you enlist? In, in yeah, in Germany. Okay. Um, in nineteen, I was in the army a year, a mm -hmm. year and one day. And um, what had happened? I don't know. I I looked like I was um, when I went in the service. I looked like I was sixteen. And while I was in there, I really thought about what I was going to do when I left the, the service. Because I only looked like 17. I only looked like 17, but I was 21. But I looked like I was 17. I said to myself, you know, I said, if I go back home, I'm going to want doing the same thing. So I talked to a couple of sergeants that had been in like 15, 10 years. And I talked to them about uh, being in the service. <clears throat> so what they said to me was, um, how long you been in? I told them a year and a day. They said, you already did. He said, rest of, rest of everything else is downhill. So I went to my re, uh, re-enlistment, come to find out I was the only uh, U.S. that wasn't having re list. So we got to talking. I was on, I was on uh, like, uh, I had to do extra duty because I went AWOL. Mm -hmm. So the, the funny part about it, I was on, they had me grounded to the, the missile site. So he came in, we got to talking. I said, you get me off of this. And then I said, I really enlist for six years. Next day, he called me, I was off. And uh, so we got to talking, so it was, it was good. He, uh, we talked about a lot of things. Mostly, I wanted to go infantry. So I asked him that I had the, the, the skills and had the, the knowledge to be an infantry soldier. He said, yeah. And then we got to talking and I started, I said, well, I needed, I needed to do a job that in the service that I could do on the outside when I got out. So we picked photography. <clears throat> so out of the photography, uh, I wanted to take motion pictures because they was the hardest. And um, once you did that, you could do anything else. So I took the hardest course. So now, now, where was was that school? This was at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. I wouldn't go there until um, September. I would go there in nineteen. I went there in November. Yeah, I went around November of nineteen sixty-eight. Nineteen sixty. Eight, yeah. Okay. And uh, it was only 15 weeks. Uh, what I learned in 15 weeks, it took somebody going to college four years to learn. And uh, so I had uh, orders to go to Fort Cameron after school. So I had two sets of orders. One sent me to school and one that sent me to my duty station, which was Fort Cameron, the home of the 101st. But all of them was in uh, Vietnam. Uh, the 173rd was in Vietnam. So when I got there, there was no single corps there. So when I got there, it was kind of strange. They went back and tried to put me into my um, my f uh, secondary MOS, which was um, a supply. So I fought them all the way because I was school trained. I had the skill. So I wound up working in the recreation uh, in the recruiting center for uh, new, uh, new recruits coming in. So I was taking a picture because I had that mm -hmm. skill 
And then all of a sudden I wound up going to a, um, the single um, single unit, which was um, full of civilians, and I was the only military there. And they did like um, they took military pictures and stuff. So I was sitting down. So what had happened? They came and asked me to get my camera. So what camera? So they came with the 16 millimeter camera. They said, "You're gonna go and assign me." I said, "Where?" They said, "On the runway." And what I didn't know while I was getting ready to film, I was getting ready to film the first National Guard medic unit that was coming back from Vietnam. And they was on their way home. And um, they lost three medics in Vietnam. And they got a whole lot of medals. So they were walking on that for camera. I wound up taking their picture and they, they did a good job. Um, then, I, then they told me, well, you got the right of capture. I said, what? <laughs> I said, I got the right of what? What you film? And I had to remember everything that I had filmed by memory. Close-ups, long shots, uh, who was in the picture, uh, what did I did, and everything. So I wrote it. The secretary typed it up, and they sent it to uh, the Army Pictorial Center. They wrote me back and told me it was excellent that they can use every bit of the footage. Next thing I know, come November, the, no, come October, I think the, no, it came September the 26th, I got orders to go to Vietnam. And at that same time, my mom had a heart attack. So it was kind of hard trying to tell her that I'm getting ready to go to Vietnam, so I told her a lot. I told her I was going to Korea. And that kind of eased it up, you know. Mm -hmm. But she knew that something was wrong because I wasn't happy about going to Korea. So uh, I told her I, was, uh, for, I stayed with my mom in the hospital like two weeks. I had like a week and a half to go. And I told her I was on my way to Vietnam. I went home. Next thing I know, my mom was walking through the door. She said, I'm not going to stay in the hospital if you got to go to Vietnam. So two weeks, a week went by. I was on my way to uh, to California to catch that plane to uh, Vietnam. And it was a funny part about it. When I got there, you know, they they locked down the post. You can't leave when you're on your way out. So we snuck out. <laughs> we went to a, one of the little shows, you know. And at that time, they were filming uh, movies in this alley, and we stood there watching them. And uh, we got there, and all of a sudden, I got hemorrhoids. <laughs> so the guys that I was going to Vietnam with, they wound up being down the seven calf down the mace. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I get an operation, and uh, he didn't no, give me no anesthesia, no. He said, look, it's going to be a sharp pain. I said, okay. He bent me over, the table rised up, and I felt the sharp pain. Then he started digging in it. Then he gave me these pads. <laughs> he said, well, you're not gone. Now, my buddies and them, they was leaving the next day. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to be on the plane with them. So the doctor told me, no, you can't go. Gave me all these pads. So the guy started cheese, uh, teasing me. <laughs> Paul? Um, no, keep going. And um, they started teasing me, talking about, oh, yeah, I see you got your period on because I had these pads, I had to change them every day. So they left the next day. I didn't leave till three days later. I left on um, October the 26th. They was already in Vietnam. And I wouldn't, by the time I got there, it was very strange. When I got there, it was hot. I mean, when you walked out the plane, I mean, you could see the heat just going straight up. Stop. And uh, when I got there, they uh, took me to the personnel center. Mm -hmm. Where you were assigned in, so. No, no, you landed at uh, Cameron? No, I landed at Tunston New Air Base. Oh, Saigon. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so when we got there, they took us to the personnel. So when I walked in there, I told them I was um, 84 Charlie 20. That's motion picture photographer. Soon as I said that, they got on the phone, called my company, and told them we got an 84 Charlie here. And... Um, they said, what, we'd be down to get 
<laughs> so it was another photographer there. He was a still photographer, but he was going to the company too. So all of a sudden the chopper landed. This guy got out. They had just took him out of the field. He had he had he had all his ammunition on his pack, and he was carrying a sixty. He dropped it right in the middle of the field and walked into the personnel office. They gave him his orders, and he got on the plane that I was getting off. And also, I wait for it. Here come the truck. The truck came, so they took me to the company personnel so I could sign in. They told me, you got an 84 child ahead. Before they even hung the phone up, the truck was there to pick me up. But what was so funny, I was the only black that was a combat photographer of motion pictures. And there was this white guy and rat, sitting right beside me. And we got to talking. And all of a sudden, they came and, sit, and walked right to him and said, you're 84, Charlie, 20? And he said, no. And the guy, so they went in there to find out who, who I was. So the guy came out, he said, yeah. He said, hey, here go your 84, Charlie, 20. And they looked at me. They were shocked because they didn't have no uh, black photographers there. So when I got to the company, they thought it was a joke. They really thought it was a joke. And um, when I got there, it was f it was kind of funny because as soon as I got there, I wasn't in the company one day. The first thing that I know, they had me in the mail in the supply room. They, they were giving me all my gear. They were giving me food. They were giving me ammunition. I went and picked up my 45, and they gave me a set of orders and said, you're moving out tomorrow. I said, what? They said, you're moving out tomorrow. You'll be out there for 30 days. And they say, matter of fact, go down, because we had to roll our film up into 100 cans. And you had 2,000 feet of film. You mm -hmm. had to roll up into cans of 100. So I did that, came out, rolled my film up, hoping that I did it right. And I did do it right. So we went out, and uh, they took me with a photographer that had experience in combat. So we, he took me kind of light, you know, he didn't really take me out into actual combat. So me and him just went wherever he wanted, met some Australians. As soon as they saw that I was a motion picture photographer, they offered me to go with them. And I started to go with them, but the guy that was um, my team leader, mm -hmm. he told me no, because I wanted to get right into some action. I mean, I wanted to really get into some action, some combat. So after that, we um, kind of went different places. Then I wound up going to Fubai, which was a support, uh, a support for another uh, fire support base they were just building. So he took me there instead of combat. Now, there's no Bawai, no Constantine, no nothing. And we standing there. They had um, three, four houses. And the rest of it was mortars. And they had one infantry unit there. And we said, <laughs> and it was funny, the night that we got there, they was running minimum rounds. And that means every minute they was firing. House was firing. And at about, about maybe 400, about 400 clicks from where we was at, they had a battalion of VC going across our path. And I looked at them. I looked at him and I said to myself, it was nothing to stop them. I mean, the jungle was close, uh, bloomed back, but we had no Constantine wide, we had nothing. So it was just like one end and out the other. Mm -hmm. But we had the support from Fubai. So we, I stayed there about a couple of days, uh, took pictures of the engineers blowing back a, blowing back a jung jungle. Uh, then after that, we came back and um, I stand down. You have to write your captions. Uh, you got to write what's in each can. Uh, you have to use all the film up. 2,000 feet of film, you have to use it all up. So I had to use it up, so I had to type that. Then I had to go reload up all my film again and get the food and stuff and new ammunition and um, turn in what I had. So you were living on sea rations, basically? Yeah, that's all we ate. Uh, unless I got to a, like a, a fire support base, maybe I might get one hot meal. Because most of the time I was on a chopper going here or hopping there. 
So, for a while, it, it was pretty good. I, I got a lot of pictures. Then the guys that was in my company, uh, they really thought that I didn't know what I was doing. And every time I would get, because when you send it off, they send you a critique of your film. And every one of my films were excellent. So I put it up on the board so they could see it. And um, I had wrote a motion picture script for the Army called uh, Million Dollar Hill. And it was about uh, a hill in, in Korea. So I had sent it to the Army Pictoria Center. Somehow it came back to Vietnam. And I had a captain, a major, and a colonel bring it to me. And they sat down and talked to me about my script. And that's when everything started changing. Because now they knew that I was good at what I was doing. And then I started going with uh, different team members. I went with a sergeant to film um, The Longest Bridge in, um, over there, uh, up in, uh, what was that? the name? They had just built a bridge up there. And because, so the day I was standing on the bridge, the Viet Cons were to blow it up. So nobody would get on the bridge. So they were still walking on the railroad tracks. So I'm standing on this bridge, filming the railroad tracks, filming all around, up in the helicopter, filming it um, from the helicopter, hanging out the door feet, <laughs> waving like this. And I'm looking down 10,000 feet down at this bridge. And... Um, then they take me from 10,000 to 5 down to 2 around this bridge and then I'm on the ground. And I could have did better, uh, but they didn't want me to go too far off because the bridge was supposed to be blown. I'm standing on it. They didn't want me to leave too far from my team leader. Then after that, I finished. They took me back and I went back out in the field. Then I became a team leader. And I wound up, um, they wanted me, just before I left Vietnam, they wanted me to take a team out. I told them, you're crazy. I said, I got 30 days, 45 days left. I said, I'm not even going out there. And I told them why. Because the 101st had already left when I was, they was already leaving from the north. Uh, Medicaid had packed up and they was leaving. Uh, the 24th Infantry that was down the bottom of the hill where, where I was stationed at, mm -hmm. they call it Mace. They was packing up and leaving. Um, the 173rd had already gone. Uh, the calf, they was packing their stuff up because they own all of North Vietnam. Um, and because as soon as you get there, you see a big old sign that said, you are now in calf country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they had signs everywhere. Um, they had the most choppers. They had uh, more soldiers than other units did, and they stayed out in the field a whole lot. So I really followed the calf a lot. And um, just before I left, the, the first and the fifth got their colors. They had one major campaign, and they got their colors. So they don't have the color, the patch with the quarter horse and the black river. They got two battle stars and a, red, and a blue river. And the battle stars are blue, and they back at uh, their home in uh, Kansas. But the rest of the calf had to go back to Korea. They need one more engagement, uh, major engagement, and they will have their coats back. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I did a lot of um, a lot of a lot of filming. Now, I, were you ever uh, under direct fire, or were you wounded at all? Uh, I got hurt. I got <laughs> blew out of a tree. I was, I was doing, uh, um, I was taking pictures of, um, and I was taking pictures and they were blowing back the jungle to, to clear it uh, for, um, not, they was clearing the jungle back uh, over 2,000 meters mm -hmm. so they have a killing zone. And I was up in the tree filming it and uh, the back that blew me out of the tree. I was like two stories high and it blew me out of the tree. When I woke up, I was like this with the camera in my hand looking up. <laughs> so the guy came over, he asked me, was I okay? You know, they check you, make sure you was breathing. I was out for a while. Um, 
Then I got up. They slowly got me up after they saw that I had no broken bones and, and I was okay. And I got up, put on my pack, and I followed the infantry out. And I just kept on going. And um, then I was on um, some combat uh, with the seven cap. I just happened to walk into, they were getting ready to go out in the field, and I said, could I go with you? And they was happy to have a photographer with them. And I went out with them, and we was not there for about maybe 20 minutes, and all of a sudden, stuff just broke out. I mean, when it broke out, it broke out. And it didn't last long, but it lasted long enough for about five people to get killed. So after that, we came back. I went back out in the field. I left them. Then I went back out with another, uh, another infantry. Then while I was down there, I looked at a friend of mine that was a photographer in my unit. He went down to uh, down south, and a friend that uh, one of my friends that we went to serve together, ended together, and we was in Germany together. He was a sergeant in Eleven Calf. And I went down there to see him. He was shocked when I walked up on him. He was really shocked. So I stayed with him for a while, for about about 25 days. We talked about his wife, and we talked about home. We talked about Germany. And he asked me why I didn't get promoted. I said, well, you know how it is. He said, yeah, I know how you are. So we just laughed, you know. And then I was, I packed up, put the first chopper out. I was back in uh, Long Beach. Yeah, what rank were you? I was a spec four then, at okay. the time. And um, I was a team leader. When I became a team leader then, they still didn't promote me, but I really didn't care, because I was having fun taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And um, then I wrote a motion, just before I left, I wrote a motion picture script uh, that I wrote in Vietnam. And I just finished doing it, it called uh, Ghost Patrol. It really was called, um, the first time I wrote it, it was called um, um, Operation Black Patrol. It was about the black soldiers in Vietnam. And what I did, I had took, because I was into research, I took, um, I started researching uh, about soldiers. And what I did, all the ones that had died, I had put them into this movie because they had won Silver Stars, Brown Stars, Medal of Honor, even some of them. The first, uh, the first officer that was killed in Vietnam was black. Uh, he was uh, saving the so he was saving his unit. They got mm -hmm. in the ambush, and other for him to get them out of the ambush, he had to stand in the front line of fire, and he got killed uh, saving them. Uh, then um, I wrote it. And I had uh, the army to prove it because anything I write belongs to them. And they were kind of mad because I didn't finish it. It took me um, almost 10 years to finish it. And um, then I want to change the name. It's pretty good, too. Uh, then after that, I came back to the States. Uh, I wanted working in. Um, TV station at Fort Dix, New Jersey. So you so you were discharged when you got back from Vietnam? No, I had two more years left. Okay. And um, they wanted to send me to Korea. I told them, you got your mind? I said, I'm just leaving a war zone where people have chinky eyes, and now you're going to send me to Korea? I said, man, you'd be better off sending me someplace else like Panama. Then they looked at me, and I wanted to go into Fort Dix. Uh, when I got to Fort Dix, you're not, when you come back out of combat zone, you're not allowed to have any weapons for a year. So I had to wind up being a supply clerk, and the whole time I was there, I had a lot of problems at Fort Dix. And um, I finally, just before my year was up, I wound up working in the TV station. That was the best thing I ever had, working mm -hmm. in the TV station, because I had the skills. Um, I was still a spec for, and I loved it. Uh, then it was time for me to get out, so in October 1973, I was out. Uh, it was hard when I got out looking for a job, especially in my profession. Uh, there was no jobs at that time, um, so I went to school. 
uh, I went to college. Uh, first, I went back to high school to get my high school diploma. Because the Army, the first diploma I ever got was from the Army. So they gave me an incentive to go back to high school. I was 25 when I went back to high school, mm -hmm. the oldest senior in high school. Um, at that time, I didn't go back to Philadelphia. I wound up living in uh, Newburgh, New York, and going to Newburgh Free Academy. So I was the oldest senior there. And um, I wanted to graduate in, in August because I had to uh, go to summer school for English, which I knew. Mm -hmm. um, so I wound up going, going, after I did that, I worked for a little while. Then one day I just said, you know, it got to be something better than this. So I went up to a friend of mine's. He came and got me. They need basketball players at this the school called Mount St. Mary's. So, man, he got to talking. He said, come on, man, we go up there, you know, you play ball, you know, blah, blah, this and blah, blah. So I went up there, uh, January of 19, I went up there January of 1974. And 75, I would get in school. And it was funny, I never had no college courses, so um, they was kind of, the Catholic school is very strange people. But the thing about it, I told her, if you give me, if you let me in here, I said, you give me my degree at the end. And they let me in on faith. And I graduated and um, <laughs> Sister Pat was my counselor and they looked at me. And she said, you remember what you told us the first time you came here? And I had forgot all about it. They said, if we let you in, we'll give you your degree at the end. And she handed me my degree. I forgot all about what I had said to them, and they remember. Now, what did you get your degree in? Uh, history and secondary education. I was teaching uh, at Newburgh Free Academy for about 10 years, there in the school system. And I, but the reason I went to school, I wanted to uh, get a degree to back my photography skills up. Mm -hmm. And I wound up teaching school for a while, uh, for 10 years. And then I left because I still had that, I still wanted to get into that photography. And I still had that love for photography, and I still do today. Uh, but it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard field to really get into. And I'm, now I'm 60 years old, so that's a lot of, that's a lot of years. Um, since 25, since I was 25 years old. Uh, I've been trying to get into that field, and it's a very hard field to get into. Uh, I had a lot of interviews uh, dealing with uh, photography, but they didn't want to pay me the money. Mm -hmm. And that's how I found out that it cost with the degree and the seven years of skills that I had. I had about 10 years of photography skills that it cost me $20 an hour for them to pay me. And they were only paying like 7 or $8 an hour. I told them I just wanted to work in the field. The more I worked in the field, the better. I gained back all my uh, my skills, mm -hmm. and um, so after that, I just did odd jobs and different jobs, and I wound up meeting Sam up here, and that's opened another door, uh, writing scripts, which I did for the army. I, matter of fact, I was in the history of uh, single core. Mm -hmm. I was the only one that got an A for motion picture script writing. And my uh, sergeant, my teacher, he hung it up on the wall. And he told me that I made history uh, in single core special photography unit. And that made me feel good. I graduated fifth, I graduated second out of a class of 15. I graduated fifth out of class of 65. And uh, I was in the top of my class. And that made me feel good because uh, when I went to school, there was only, matter of fact, there was only five of us. Mm -hmm. um, there was three blacks and two Spanish speaking. And they was in the Marine Corps. So when I did graduate, there was only two of us that graduated out of the, the out of 65. So it was uh, strange in, in a sense because this was the first time they really had uh, black photographers, mm -hmm. especially in the motion picture field. 
So that made me feel good. Plus, I was the only uh, black motion picture photographer that was in Vietnam between 70 and 71. So I made history. Um, also, um, the company that I was in lost 28 men, photographers. In the filming of the invasion of Cambodia in 1968, they lost them there. So that made me feel good that I was in a company that actually uh, had uh, uh, photographers die. I mean, they had photography had died since uh, the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. But this was special because it was in my time and it was in my era that I represented 28,000 men that died that were photographers out of my company. And all of them did it in uh, the invasion of uh, Cambodia in 1968 when uh, Nixon. And, uh, gave the order to invade. So I knew how, by being a combat photographer, so I knew exactly what happened. You had uh, guys went out, the first part went out uh, with uh, advanced uh, infantry. They had to film the landing. Uh, some went on the chopper uh, with them. Some of them uh, stayed behind to film the lift off, and then they got on choppers. Uh, then while they was there, they was in, a, I mean, they was in actually hostility combat. Mm -hmm. And that's when most of them lost. Do you know that the Army uh, is the only one that owns Academy Award for the best black and white picture? The longest day, the one you see with John Wayne? Mm -hmm. Well, the Army filmed that. And they got Academy Award for it. And they showed the, us the film. That was the last one they showed us because you had to sit down on um, your last week of school. You actually had to sit there for a whole week and all you do is look at film. Then you had to critique it and tell what's wrong with it with uh, the color and stuff. And the war winning picture, they show you last. And that was a beautiful black and white, the way they did it. Uh, it compared to nothing to uh, John Wayne and them. Because they actually filmed the invasion from the beaches all the way until they went to, uh, to France. And they filmed that. And it was a long day, too, for the photographers and all, because they had uh, most of the films were taken on, on rooftops, out of windows, uh, on the ground. Someone was in between with soldiers. Someone was in advanced uh, scout units. So it was a good movie. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I just didn't have no popcorn. But then they showed us the Academy Award, mm -hmm. and I said to myself, I wanted one. I wanted the Academy Award. If I can get Academy Award, that would make my day, because the Army trained me, so I know that they had the goods mm -hmm. to be good at it. So now, uh, right now I'm here uh, in Albany, uh, to talk to about the motion picture script I, I'm doing now for Mrs. Johnson, uh, Henry Johnson the School that's named after. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to get permission from her so that we can push on, because see, Sam is my business manager. So everything goes through him. All I do is do the writing and the thinking, and he do the selling. So I'm kind of happy because I'm back into a field that I love. Um, and the Army taught me good. So, I'm happy. I mean, through all the things that happened in 35 years, I'm very happy. Even in my golden years, mm -hmm. I'm happy. Because I'm doing something that I love doing. And if you don't love photography, then no need to be in it. Because you go through a lot of things. I've seen a lot of combat. I enjoy being on the other side where a dude could load up an M16, I can load a can of film as the same fast as fast as he loaded up his M16 and remember everything that's on that can that I put in my pocket. So uh, it, it shocked me. It really did. The Army really, by being a photographer, really upped my mind scale. Uh, sometimes I'd be walking. I can actually see something will be a good picture to make uh, something to do uh, because it's an art. Mm -hmm. Photography is an art, a beautiful art. Uh, even though I was on the other side of the camera instead of on the other side of the gun, 
you see things different. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, I saw things different because I was on that side of the camera. So you almost by yourself. You see, uh, you see a lot of suffering. You see a lot of hurt. If you're on the side of the gun, you don't see all that. But you see everything because the camera picks up everything: sadness, uh, depression, um, pick up joy, uh, happiness. It picks up a lot of things on the camera, and you experience those things through the camera. And that's what I experienced through the camera. I experienced all these things, so. I had a different experience than the guy that was behind the gun, a uh, tanker, or um, a dude behind mortars or uh, artillery. My experience was totally different from an infantry soldier, even though me and him was together, mm -hmm. but it was totally different. Because my job, my mission was to film for the Army, train, they used training film as a means to train today's soldiers, uh, what mistakes you made as an infantry soldier, uh, which you didn't do correctly. Uh, all these films went to the archives, and as they go into the archives, they bring them back out, use them for training film, so the soldiers of today, which is in uh, Iraq and overseas, well, they learn from the mistakes that was happening in Vietnam. So they are more amped to do better because the training films. Um, training films are very important for the military. I mean, if we ever go back to Vietnam, I know my stuff is coming out of the safe. And when it come out of the safe, they're going to look at it because there's a lot of stuff that I have filmed that they can actually use as a um, advance to go into Vietnam if they want to sneak back in. <coughs> but thanks to the, uh, the veterans, Vietnam veterans, they opened the door the front way. And made it so that they feel the vet, the Vietnam fashion feel that if we go back to Vietnam, that'd be a healing point for us, and it'd be a healing point for Vietnam. So they opened that door, and thank God they did, because a lot of veterans have been going back to Vietnam. Uh, also, they've been over there looking for MIAs, because a lot of bodies were just left. Sometimes you couldn't carry that body with you. You had to leave it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you was on the run. Somebody would get killed. You had to leave it. So between years and animals, all you got is the skeleton, maybe one dog tag. But it is, uh, and I, I'm kind of glad that the door is open because that gives them the opportunity to look for these soldiers, even if it's nothing but their dog tags. And that way the United States can count for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I thank, uh, you know, I thank the Lord for a lot of things that I made it back safely. And even now I get a chance to uh, talk to like, talk to a lot of veg, uh, veg, veterans, special ones that are Vietnam veterans. They still having a lot of problems. Uh, they still have flashbacks. A lot of them don't want to come to the view. Uh, because of the reputation, a lot of them just don't want to deal with it. And not knowing that you still got young men out there from Vietnam that still need a lot of help. And a lot of them don't know what's wrong with them. A lot of them are um, having these flashbacks, and they most, some of them is very dangerous because a lot of them was in uh, special forces, a lot of them was in recon. And these guys don't, you never forget anything. Uh, and they haven't forgotten anything. It's just the point that it has been suppressed for a long mm -hmm. period of time. And sometimes it does pop up because it happened with me sometimes. But I always close my eyes and I listen. And all I hear is quiet. So when you're in Vietnam, you close your eyes and all you hear is gun, 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 and mosquitoes. Um, so here, when, when I give a flashback, I just close my eyes, and I listen, and I don't hear nothing, so I know I'm safe, I'm at home. And as long as I keep that down, I'm okay, because I know as long as I'm home, and I don't hear nothing, 
I know that I'm not in a combat zone. I'm not in a war zone, even though you got a lot of stuff going on in the, in the, st in the country. But it's nevertheless like a war zone. Mm -hmm. Because 24-7, you're on guard 24-7, all the time. Uh, wherever you walk, you can get killed. Wherever you ride, you can get killed. You don't know who your friend is or who your enemy is. It might be your hooch mama. Or it could be uh, the guy that's out there cutting grass. Uh, it could be somebody in the kitchen. So you really don't know who your enemy over there because they, they wear many faces. Not many hats. They wear many faces, but the faces are still the same. So you always have to be aware. I mean, one minute they washing your clothes, next minute they setting mines out. So it's always was a constant being on guard. But outside, I mean, some people say they had bad experience. I had bad experience, and I had good times over there. I mean, who could ride in Vietnam getting high and ride uh, the cab all the way to Da Nang in the middle of the night? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's times that... Uh, Go to Saigon and be in um, be in the bar and come ten o'clock. Everybody have to be on the base. You still in Saigon? Come the next morning <laughs> and the cops knock and the MPs knocking on the door. And ask you got any uh, soldiers in there? And they saying no. And you upstairs sleeping. <laughs> so it was um, it was good times. There was sad times. There was sad. There was sad times. Good times. There was also. Uh, times where you wish you was home. Mm -hmm. But then it was good times. I had good friends. I had uh, a lot of guys that I, I got to know, uh, spent time with. Uh, a lot of them came back. Um, guys that was um, friends that I seen die. Um, you know, I, uh, Vietnam was really a mixed feeling when you're a cameraman. Uh, when you're a, a so combat soldier, it's different because you got to you got to hold back your tears, you got to hold back your feelings, and you got to be cold. You got to leave that body on the ground, and you got to walk home because uh, you're just another soldier, and you got to do your job to stay alive so that you can go home, not in the body bag but on the plane that you came on. And being a photographer, I can show that emotion. Um, I had to sometimes suppress it, but then I ask, sometimes you ask yourself what you, you're here for and why you're here. Why so many young soldiers are dying? Because see, when I got there, I was a young man. I was like, I was only 22. Mm -hmm. And by the time I came home, I was 23. Totally different than when I got there. Um, when I got here, I saw things different. Um, but things, things had not changed in the time that I went to Vietnam and came back to the, to the States. Nothing, everything was still the same. The only thing that diff, was different, the uh, people that I grew up with, most of them were dead behind drugs or gangs. Uh, new generation, they didn't know me. I was um, a different person in a way that I had noticed that I had changed. Things had stayed the same, but I had changed. I had became a different person. And uh, I realized that uh, I had to go someplace quiet. Because uh, at that time, they wasn't uh, into uh, rehabilitation. They wasn't even, they didn't even know that uh, anything about um, uh, PT, uh, post-traumatic stress. So they didn't know nothing about that. So 20 years of my life, I had to deal with it. And I have, sometimes I would go into depression for long periods of time. And I didn't understand it. There was nobody there to tell me. By the time I went to college and learned and had Psych 101, I knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. So college kind of helped me understand me. Uh, then after that, I started recognizing the problem. Then 
at the same time I started dealing with it. And um, I started actually uh, start writing. Writing was uh, a means to um, forget everything, but remember it all. And um, as I started writing, things started disappearing. I started enjoy writing. I started reading more. Uh, I started doing research. And um, next thing I know, I was writing. And that was a good thing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, then I started doing a lot of research on uh, writing motion picture scripts. Uh, and as I started writing them, I started realizing that the best thing was to put my thoughts, my imagination, my ideas on paper. And, and maybe, you know, people like entertainment. Uh, they like uh, history, documents. So I figured why not put it all together and maybe write one of a script that I can win an Academy Award because I came from one of the best schools. And uh, that was my goal, to get an Academy Award. But to do it, see, uh, by being in the service, that was my greatest incentive. When I saw them winning the Academy Award, I knew that I could do it. So I'm still trying. And eventually, soon later, I'm hoping that I, one day you'll see me on the red carpet. You say, you know, I got his interview. I hope so. <laughs> you know, and I made it. You know, uh, and that's um, my main goal now. And I got the opportunity, so I'm just smiling. See the big old smile on my face? Because that's something that I love doing, writing, reading, research. So I feel good about that because I'm, it's like putting your foot in some place that you've never been, and now I got the opportunity to do it. And um, I'll be a failure if I don't do it. And I only fail myself. So I keep pushing. I keep pushing. Now I'm here. Look at, look at. I, I, I'm so happy. Look, I'm getting interviewed. I'm standing here in a school that I wrote a, a motion picture script about the man. And I talked to his, his granddaughter. I mean, what more can you ask? From Vietnam, from 1966. So now, I think I achieved a lot. Not to be running around, sitting in jail, uh, sitting in a psych ward, or running around here just nuts. So, in a, in a sense, the service helped me. It helped me be disciplined in my life. It helped me get a direction. And I haven't stopped. So, I feel good. Right now, I feel good. Because I came a long way. But just to be sitting here. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that may be